Hey guys, uh, so Bob Piercy here. Hope you're doing well today. Uh, I want to take a minute and actually do something different, try something new. So instead of dentistry, and because everyone's working in their practice right now and really busy and heads down, uh, dealing with COVID and the life after COVID and PPE, I wanted to kind of take a minute and step back and actually look at other areas that you know, there's information that you know, we can help with. And um, So anyways, I've known Rob Campbell from Richardson GMP for many years now. And he's talked to a lot of our events, which again, we're not really doing anymore because we're all you know, still distancing and kind of uh, keeping to ourselves. So I thought it'd be a great opportunity to bring Rob on. We're just doing a Zoom call right now. We're recording it and talk about the markets, kind of what's he seeing, what's going on, what opportunities do exist because we always hear things about second waves, third waves in the fall and winter and just kind of what's going on. And, and I thought everyone here has to have questions and I know I do personally. So anyways, Rob, thanks for doing this. This is awesome. Uh, it's, it's our first time. This is the first one. Uh, so thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Bob. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, rookie, uh, rookie jitters, but all's good. I'm looking oh, forward to it. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> butterflies for both of us. Um, and now I, I got to ask because you told me this the other day. Um, you were actually you just got back from the states. Correct. Yeah, uh, it's sort of a funny story. I went down to Houston. My wife Paige is working through uh, a medical degree down there. She's becoming a physician. Don't. I hope your dental clients won't hold it against me. But uh, I know. I know the rivalry exists there. But uh, she's doing her clinical rotations in Houston, and she'd got shut down at the start of COVID and came home with her two kittens. And uh, she went back a month or two ago when she got restarted, but wasn't able to travel with the cat. So I was the cat delivery man. So I had to bring Pixie and Sullivan to Houston for her and uh, managed to get across the border going that way and then had to do the full quarantine when I returned home. But, 14 uh, days and you came back. So, yeah. so delivering cats is an essential service. Yeah, exactly. It's part right. of the Richardson G GMP suite of services. <laughs> <laughs> well, and actually I got a quick story on that and we'll, we'll keep this brief. Um, we'll get to the meat here soon, but um, friend of the friend of the friend of the family sort of story but apparently someone went down to the, the u.s border to drive and they what's the purpose of coming into the states and they said well i've got a place down in in arizona and there's been uh, pipes have burst and there's issues and i need to go down and, and, and fix it and so anyway so they let them into the u.s and apparently when they pulled up to their property they were met by by the sheriffs and the sheriffs the u.s sheriff said okay please show us these issues you're having with your house and there were none they just wanted to go down to the states and check it out this person can no longer go to the states for five years. You're kidding! Oh yeah, dead goodness. serious. So, I, so, so, essential services delivering cats is awesome, and I'm glad you're allowed back and you can go back to the states. Uh, this person, yeah, is apparently banned from the U.S. <clears throat> excuse me, for the next five years because they lied to the U.S. Customs as to uh, um, why they needed to go to the states and what was essentially not essential. Yeah, um, I was I was approved going both ways. So. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad. Um, so, hey, real quick, I guess just kind of jumping in and, and the, the main question I think a lot of people have is like, um, what have you guys seen in the market besides, you know, what we hear, hear on news and I guess like, how are your portfolios, you know, surviving and managing now in this post-COVID period compared to say other uh, other portfolios? What's well, a really good question. And I, I thought what I might do is just kind of touch on some, some, I guess, pain that a lot of people seem to share through that COVID sell-off, which uh, peaked in late March. Um, it was really interesting. And, and in order to do that, what I might do first, just touch on a couple of portfolio management basics. I yeah, expect most, most, of you, most of the people that would listen in on this would understand, but kind of the primary tool we use to protect ourselves from risk is diversification. So what that means is within your portfolio, you select different asset types with the idea being that they move differently as, uh, as the economic climate changes. Now, how you measure that diversification when you look at two assets is um, something called correlation, the statistical term. We probably all remember it from our undergrad math courses. So if you've got two assets and if they move together in the same uh, direction and quantity, they're perfectly correlated. Their correlation is one. Now, if they had no correlation whatsoever, the correlation is zero, and, and some assets can even be negatively correlated. So historically, what you do is you build a portfolio with assets with, with uh, a, a low correlation, the idea me meaning they move differently and hopefully protect you when things get tough. But that's kind of not what played out in March. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll show a slide that kind of demonstrates that a little bit if it makes sense to you, Bob. Yeah, yeah, hey, please, pictures are, pictures are great. Sounds good. Now you'll also, I, I know you would be aware of it and I suspect most of your um, guests on here are as well, but kind of 
when I talked about those two asset classes, kind of two of the main ones are you, you uh, diversify between your equities and your fixed income or bonds. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a couple of the key building blocks in a portfolio. Now, what you see from this slide here, this compares the correlation of, uh, of equities, first of all, um, so you're looking at Canadian and U.S. equities as correlated to global equities. Right. But then you're also looking at global and Canadian fixed income or bonds. And this is a bit of a busy slide, but it's interesting. It's comparing four different time periods. So through normal time periods, well, through all time periods, what you see is that Canadian equities, global equities, U.S. equities, they all have a correlation very close to one, meaning they all move together kind of thing. Markets are going the, the market up, going goes up, up everywhere. Up. Mark you goes bet. down, they're going down. down, they're going down. Now, fixed income in normal times, which is the first two bars in each of these groupings. So in normal times, fixed, fixed income doesn't have a high correlation with equities, meaning oftentimes when equity markets are going down, your bonds are going up or vice versa. That brings stability to your portfolio. The problem we saw in COVID is that and in other times of crisis, like here we're highlighting the 2008 uh, financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis, is correlation rise in times of crisis. Now, in COVID, we wound up seeing it in spades. So COVID doesn't appear on that, but the, the, the selling, the weakness that we saw in markets in COVID was because people were selling for two reasons. One, they were panicking because they right. didn't know what was happening in the world. Two, they were selling because they needed to raise funds to potentially pay salaries next month or rent next month. And the problem is when you get that panic or liquidity-based selling, everything goes down equally. So people's portfolios were much more hard hit than they thought because both their bonds and their equities were going down. So that's what I mean when I say correlations go to one at a time of crisis. And was that, and you guys are seeing that in your portfolios as well? So, so we were fortunate in that we managed to insulate our portfolios a little bit from that. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today is there's a really terrific tool out there um, called Alternative Investments. And Alternative Investments have really grown out of the institutional world. So big pension funds, endowments, uh, family offices use Alternative Investments because alternative investments truly have a little bit, have, have, have low or no correlation with both equities and fixed income. So by adding that third ingredient to a portfolio, you can really stabilize things and protect on, on the downside. And maybe what I'll do, I, I mentioned this came out of the institutional world. Why don't I share a couple of stats with you in terms of kind yeah. of how prevalent they are in the ins institutional world? Yeah, please. All right, I'm just gonna move forward from this. So this is really interesting. So what you're seeing on the screen here is the allocation to alternative investments for three uh, kind of buckets. First, you're seeing the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan with 58% alternatives, the CPP with 56%, US endowments, so a broad average of US endowments of 52% allocation to alternatives. And then over here, we've got your typical retail investor with almost none. And, uh, and, and so it's, uh, it's really interesting, as I mentioned, what our team tries to do is try to bring an institutional approach to personal portfolio management. The reason we do that is institutions tend to not behave emotionally, they behave rationally. And taking emotion out of the decision making is always a key to success in investing. So we try to sort of uh, model what institutions do and, uh, and adopt some of, uh, of this type of strategy. Okay, um, so this is, looking at this chart here, it's obviously very evident as to who's investing in these alternative uh, investments. I guess two quick questions and they're kind of related, like what are alternative investments? What, what is that category? And um, like, why aren't retail investors doing this? Why is it you guys and not, and not them? Or these large institutions and not yeah. them? It's a really, really great question on both fronts. So alternative investments, first of all, in terms of what they are, um, and it's really kind of a broad category that a lot of stuff gets put into, but it can in include uh, areas like uh, private debt or private credit, arbitrage strategies, private equity. Um, it, it, it really is very broad, but kind of the key thing is that all, 
the way we use alternatives, which is the way I think makes sense, is we use them as risk reduction strategies. Now there is alternatives out there where you can enhance risk in your portfolio, but we think they're a much better tool for uh, reducing and managing risk. Now in terms of your second question and why not, why aren't more people using them? Uh, there's, there's kind of, there's a few reasons. So. I'll touch on two of them quickly, and then for a third one, I'm going to refer to a slide. But the first two is a lot of these alternatives have very high minimums. So you might need uh, 100,000 or a mil million or even 5 million to invest with them because they come out of that institutional world. Now, we're really fortunate that we manage on a discretionary basis on behalf of uh, a number of different families. So we can, for example, if we invest 50,000 each on behalf of 100 families, we can be on side with a $5 million minimum. And because we're discretionary portfolio managers, we can move our investments like that for all of our households at once. So that's a real door opener. The second reason why people don't, don't use them is that a lot of investment firms they're dealing with out there uh, or teams just haven't embraced them. Now, one of the reasons why is many firms um, have a bias to selling their own proprietary product and solutions. Now, the firm that I'm at, Richardson GMP, we pride ourselves on maintaining an open architecture. So we never invest in a Richardson GMP anything. What that means is we're shopping the world for the best solutions for our clients. Now, and in fact, as an aside, that independence has allowed us uh, to achieve our CFIX designation. We're, we're recognized as a fiduciary by an international organization called the Center for Fiduciary Excellence. I believe to this date, we're still the only Canadian investment management firm that has that CFIX designation and recognition as a fiduciary. So that independence is a big part of it. So those are two of the reasons why, kind of high minimums, perhaps a, a firm that, that doesn't have an open door policy to these things. The third thing is kind of the catch uh, that I'm going to mm -hmm. talk about and I'm going to share a slide here. Um, so alternatives so far probably sound really great. Hopefully they do. Um, and so people are probably wondering, well, what's the catch and what are you giving up by investing in these things? First of all, let's just talk briefly about kind of everyone's dream investment. So the dream investment has high returns, it's got low volatility, and it's got high liquidity. The problem is you can never really get all three of these things at once. Now, what we found with alternative investments is that um, if you sacrifice a little bit of liquidity, uh, you can move, move significantly up in terms of return and significantly down in terms of volatility or heightening your, your predictability. So one of the challenges with these alternative investments is that uh, oftentimes these strategies, um, unlike your bonds or stocks, where if you phone me to sell today, I could send you your money tomorrow, right. I might need 60, 90, or even 120 days to process a sale. And an instant in, in an instant gratification world, a lot of people don't like that, right. but it's actually a huge uh, benefit because it protects those underlying strategies from the panic selling we saw in COVID. So, uh, so that's kind of a few reasons why people perhaps aren't using them as widespread as I think they should. Besides the fact of just being able to get my money fast uh, through traditional means like you talk about being able to buy or sell today and get the money tomorrow. Um, is there any, besides the fact that I want that, is there any real advantage to investing in those markets that have high liquidity? Uh, well, certainly in a portfolio, you need to balance. So I wouldn't okay. advocate anyone putting all their money in alternative investments. <laughs> you know, your, your, your dental clients are a great example where when things were shutting down rapidly during COVID, suddenly you've got no revenue coming in and, uh, and you may need to be drawing on your investments to be paying rent or, uh, rent or salaries. And hopefully that was short lived. And I know most of my clients and I think yours are kind of back to normal operations, but you wouldn't want all your money tied up. So we do have to strike a balance across a portfolio and manage that liquidity, knowing that, um, we're prepared for our clients worst case scenario with liquid securities, but then right. su supplementing them with some less liquid securities that really can drive up return and and enhance predictability. Okay, and so then would a, a good portfolio, I guess it's probably all depending upon the, the client, but basically a third, a third, a third from being you know traditional stocks and bonds and then alternative assets or investments? Probably, right? Yeah, that's probably a decent place to start. Um, really, uh, you know, 
there's no cookie cutter solution in the wealth management world. And we really pride ourselves on understanding our clients' needs, their risk tolerance, the pressures in their business and their life and coming up with customized solutions. Now, I've talked about kind of some of the, the obstacles to using alternatives. Um, and I've kind of talked about why, why don't I take you through some results just to see, kind of see the impact on a portfolio. Yeah, that'd be great. Actually. Yeah, thank you. You're the expert here, so I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> deferring to you. Anything you want to say that needs to be said, but yeah, please, uh, let's, uh, let's get the information out there. And yeah. Oh, thank you. Now, it's important to realize as I bring up this next slide that I'm not talking about any one specific strategy here, but um, there is some data that was put together to look at a few of the leading institutional endowment money managers out there, um, specifically the Ivy League schools in the U.S. Now, Yale University Endowment, coincidentally, is one of the most well-known sort of copied and followed institutional money managers. They're very, very well respected. Now, this graph or this graphic isn't necessarily intuitive, but what you're doing is you're seeing two things here. So first of all, for the Ivy League schools and for your typical retail investor, um, as represented by someone investing 60% equities, 50% or excuse me, 40% fixed income or bonds, what you're seeing is first of all, the dot up here, the kind of yellow or orange dot, is their allocation to alternatives. Now you can see that your typical retail investor has no alternative investments, whereas these institutions range, you know, from 46 to over 70% alternatives. Now what's fascinating is the bar below is their long-term track record in terms of rate of return. And so by adding those institutions or adding those alternative investments, as you can see, the track record of these institutions is far better than, uh, than what uh, your typical retail investor would have experienced historically. Now, uh, that kind of leads into something else that I might comment on too, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. And it's just, so when you hear about these things, you might be envisioning putting money in and, you know, having your money double next year. Right. That's not, again, that's not how we use these alternative investments. It's really for risk management. And the whole idea is to win by not losing. Now, Bob, you and I have talked about this before, the importance of kind of not losing your money. That's, right. that's in fact, kind of the first rule of investing. Warren right? Buffett, that's his, that's yeah. his quote. Yeah, don't exactly. lose. Exactly. And, and, you know, it comes down to math. If you, if you invest $100, and it declines to 50, if you lose half, you need 100% return to just, just to get back to break even. Right. Now, the beauty of adding these alternative investments is it allows us, like institutions do, to really enhance predictability and win by not losing. And what it does for you is in a time like COVID, your portfolio is holding up much better, so you're not coming from as far down when you're trying to replace that, uh, that loss. I, I can't help but, you know, thinking about dentistry and our, and our um, environment that we're in, our, our industry, uh, when you start talking about, you know, investing like an institution, I, I can't help but the correlation that we have right now in dentistry where, where you have, you know, predominantly a lot of solo entrepreneurs, owners, and, you know, you do have the big corporate entities that are growing and it's like the, 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 the beast in the corner that everyone's kind of talking and whispering about. And um, how do you do business like, like the big guys, how do you do business when, when you're a smaller, you know, single uh, doctor practice? And so take that and apply that to this scenario where you have maybe a retail investor who's again, like a traditionally, like a, say, a, again, a, a doctor owned clinic versus, you know, the Harvards, the Yales, these large institutions you talk about, how do we invest like them? And so I just, um, I, I, I could see the, the similarity. I could see the, the, the reference, and so I'm sure others yeah, could as well. That's an excellent analogy. And yeah, it's like anything out there. I think if you're an entrepreneur, um, what your dentist, dentist clients are, uh, you want to be taking the best things from other businesses, whether yeah. that's corporate, dental, or elsewhere. And certainly that's something that we fully subscribe to in the investment world. You know, there's not a lot of new ideas out there. And so looking at what the most successful and best investors are doing can often really lead you down a path to, uh, to greater success, in my opinion. Cool. Hey, Rob, I, I think this is awesome. I, I don't want to make this too long. So I want to kind of keep it short and concise for people. So because you know, time is valuable. Um, before we do kind of wrap this up, is there anything else you wanted to touch on that I haven't asked or anything else? That, yeah, uh, just a, a couple of quick things that I'll add. Um, first and foremost, Bob, one is that... Um, 
as as you know, and I'll, I'll just let your your viewers know uh, by by virtue of the relationship that we have, we have relaxed minimums for clients of Bob's, and we also have reduced fees, a bit of a fee discount. So if any of your clients are considering whether alternatives might be a fit for their portfolio, I'd welcome the opportunity to speak with them. And of course, they've got some uh, some cost advantages right off the hop from being a client of yours. Uh, secondly, as as you know. Um, I really uh, admire and respect how Henry Schein and you in particular, Bob, really take a holistic approach to what your clients are doing. You try to help them across all aspects of their business, which is, of course, why we've partnered over the years. But uh, I want to thank you for that. Thank you for that approach. Tell you I admire it. And I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this today. So thanks so much for everyone's time. Rob, thank you very much. Yeah, this has been a neat little experiment we're trying right now. And I hope it takes off. I hope it gets... Um, get some traction. I hope people appreciate it and uh, find it interesting. And I'll definitely include your contact information in the email below. So people who want to reach out to you directly, uh, by all means can do so. Um, if you guys have any questions, so I, I'm talking to the viewer now, if you guys have any questions about what you saw and you want to know more, or if you want uh, maybe expanded ideas on different topics, uh, please let us know. Because Rob and I want to do this uh, again sometime in the not too distant future. And again, if we can know where we should grow this conversation, we would appreciate your feedback. So, um, Please reach out to either me, to Rob on anything you saw today. And again, hey, Rob, thanks a lot. And I think if, um, yeah, let, let's wrap it up right here and we'll, we'll catch up soon, okay? Awesome. Thanks so much, Bob. All right, Take Rob. Care. Hey, have, have a great, great day, day, buddy. You bet.